um, as we get started. Yeah, thanks a ton, Archita. So I have a colleague, Archita, with us as well, uh, who's helping us with the webinar. Now, uh, what I'm going to do as we uh, perhaps just give it a few more seconds, uh, Archita, what I'd like to do is in the interest of time, um, perhaps, you know, if we, uh, if we still have Abhishek coming in, we'll just start off with uh, just the context, a little bit about Nallscape, uh, and then, you know, we just optimize for the time that we've got, right? So, uh, great. So, uh, you know, for those of us who probably uh, are interacting with us as an organization, perhaps for the first time, are not aware of what we do at Nallscape, just to give you a bit of a background, uh, we're into the space of helping leaders and organizations be future ready. Uh, and essentially, when it comes to understanding uh, things that you do well and things that you can do better, or what we call as leadership overall, uh, there are ways and means that individuals can build that. And uh, we at Nallscape help organizations and individuals develop those skills uh, you know, through the use of technology. Uh, a lot of the work that we do is uh, you know, using uh, our products that are world-class in terms of simulations. Uh, and in terms of the work that we do falls into two large buckets. One is what is called as lead now, and the second essentially, which is lead next. Lead now is largely about looking at how do you lead in the right here, right now, uh, bucketed into leading self, leading others, and leading business. And the other piece, essentially, which is uh, lead next, is about how do you lead in the future? You know, what does the future look like? What are the skills of the future? And what do industries look like? And so do leaders need to operate in a different manner? Are there some skills and mindsets that they need to pick up that aren't existing? All of this is what we do in the in the space of lead next now while there is a whole lot of work in development as far as lead next is concerned we also take it very seriously um, uh, upon ourselves uh, to be able to look at do we create awareness and understanding uh, of what the future looks like a major part of our lead next essentially is working on digital transformations uh, and you know our ceo and founder Rajiv Jairaman is an expert in this particular space, also has written a book, Clearing the Digital Blur. Now, in this particular sort of effort of evangelizing what leadership of the future is and helping individuals develop that, uh, we work on sessions of the sorts that you are in today, uh, which are industry, uh, you know, with, with lenses of industries to understand how digital transformation works in these industries. Uh, of course, there are such sessions we've done in the past and tons of these, um, you know, to come in in the future. Today, of course, we are here to discuss the role of digital transformation in the future of manufacturing as an industry, right? So that's essentially what we would be looking at. Uh, and with us, uh, you know, in this journey to discover their experience uh, through digital transformation uh, in their career and then in the organizations that are in at the moment, we've got our two esteemed panelists. Uh, so what I will do, of course, is uh, without further ado, um, you know, uh, just uh, let our participants, of course, I'll uh, briefly sort of call them out in terms of, uh, you know, their profiles. And then I, uh, you know, request the panelists to introduce themselves. So uh, you hear from the horse's mouth, right? So uh, our first panelist, uh, Dr. Chua, uh, is a PhD in engineering. Uh, and among the, uh, you know, the, the, uh, how shall I say, organizations that he's worked with include the Monash University, Western Digital, uh, and currently he's the, um, you know, the head of HR Development Center for um, Malaysia, uh, the, 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 the um, Smart Factory 4.0. So what I'm going to do is, of course, uh, you know, this is perhaps just a very, very brief description. I'd like to invite Dr. Chua to, to perhaps uh, throw a little more light um, on himself and his uh, experience. And then we pick it from there. So uh, thanks a ton, uh, Dr. Chua, for joining us. And we'd like to hear a bit more about you. All right. Uh, thanks, Rohan. Um, a very good evening uh, from Malaysia, right? And a good afternoon to everyone. So my name is Dr. Chua, and I represent the Selangor Human Resource Development Center as the head of Malaysian Smart Factory 4.0. So generally, what we do is that we focus on um, helping companies to accelerate digital transformation. Uh, and we do it more towards the people-focused strategy, um, which we call it uh, the factory technologies framework, to help companies to actually digitize their, their process faster. 
right? So this is generally what we do at the Malaysian Smart Factory. And we hope to, of course, share, you know, what we uh, have done with the global community and in hope to, to learn from each other as well. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Uh, you know, it is, it's easy sometimes to go detailed and be long, uh, and it's easy sometimes to be very brief and short, but wonderful to have managed both uh, together. Thanks a ton, Dr. Chua, and, and very, very happy to have you uh, amongst us. And of course, the conversation will lead us to look at the overall journey and what do you see. So I, I leave that for uh, you in the next part, but thank you so much for joining us. Um, our second panelist for today, uh, Mr. Abhishek Mishra, thanks Abhishek for joining us uh, today. Um, uh, just perhaps a brief from my side, uh, you know, to introduce and then over to Abhishek to perhaps, uh, you know, speak a little more about himself. Uh, he's done his Bachelor in Technology, BTEC, as well as his Master's in Personal Management. Uh, in his illustrious career spanning close to two decades, has worked in a, a whole lot of um, what I would call as sort of pedigree organizations. So your GlaxoSmithKline, uh, TCS, Quintiles, Shell, uh, Novartis, and at the moment uh, is the head of HR for India at Rockwell Automation. Um, that's perhaps the short that I can. Uh, Abhishek, thanks a ton for taking the time to be with us. May I ask you to add if there's anything that I may have missed uh, for uh, you know the benefit of our audiences today? No, sure. Uh, you know, thanks, Rohan. And uh, first of all, uh, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, and good evening, maybe, you know, those who are joining from other parts. So, but Rohan, I think you're broadly covered, uh, right? So, I think the thing which I just want to highlight is, you know, I started my career in manufacturing on the shop floor. And, uh, you know, then, of course, you know, moved on uh, to do my human resources post-graduation. And then my career moved towards, you know, human resources. So I've kind of, you know, seen both the worlds uh, and, and maybe, you know, that has helped me. But looking forward to the conversation today. Absolutely. I think what you mentioned is is beautiful in terms of, you know, uh, what the future of leadership looks like. It's not one dimensional, right? As a leader is able to look at all across, so there's a field that they come from, but are they able to look at the uh, the overall horizon of the way the industry looks uh, like, the way the organization looks like, and how are we able to sort of, you know, make sense of this? So uh, thanks a ton and welcome, uh, Abhishek, once again. Uh, what I'd like to do as we get started, and of course, the more serious aspects as we go along with the first question, essentially, uh, if you were to look at experiencing a digital world from a, from the lens of a uh, you know consumer, if you will, before we take the other lens, uh, you know, from your perspective, uh, what does digital transformation uh, you know look like from the lens of a customer? Um, you know, you'd like to just share your experience. Yeah, uh, so so maybe I, I can go on and then you know sure. eventually I can add. So I think as a consumer, what I would want is really you know so. Uh, you know, there was a time when, you know, as, uh, you know, when Ford came out, they said that, you know, you can have any, you know, color in the car so long as it is black, right? So it was, it was a time when there were no customizations to the time when customizations happened right now to the point that, you know, it's like uh, things delivered to you at your liking, uh, you know, at, at the time of your choice and maybe at the location that you want, right? So as a consumer, I think what I would want is that, you know, uh, my, uh, you know, supplier or wherever I'm kind of, you know, consuming product from should mm -hmm. be able to really, you know, pick up my needs to the depth and customize on all these dimensions, you know, right from time of delivery, location of delivery, my variant of delivery, uh, you know, accordingly. And, and to me, you know, that's real consumerism. So, yeah, sure. that's what I would say. Fantastic. Uh, thanks a ton, uh, Abhishek, for, for giving your view as a consumer before we go behind the scenes. Thanks for that. Dr. Chua, would you like to add your piece as well? Yeah, I think I think for, for digital transformation for any organization or customers or consumers, generally is to be able to make things more accessible, more convenient, right? Uh, making things more transparent for us to visualize as well. Uh, and that that sort of gives a lot of intelligence to what we are um, currently working on a day-to-day -day basis. For example, like if I want to search for something um, uh, to buy, right? Let's say a vacuum cleaner, right? And I've been searching only one brand and one particular brand. Uh, and with the kind of data that is generated uh, on a day-to-day -day basis with the kind of digital transformation that is there, um, you know, I don't, I don't just get recommended uh, one vacuum cleaner. I get recommended 
you know, 10 different brands and gives me abundance of choice, right? And uh, as, as Abhishek mentioned, you know, the, the power of customization, right? That's really what people want today, which is consumers today want to have something made for you, uniquely done for you. And that, that creates that whole different aspect of experience for uh, end user. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, it's beautiful how both of you have clearly a view at the moment that's detached from, you know, perhaps an organization delivering something to a consumer consuming. If I'm at the center of the process, you know, uh, Vishak beautifully gave us the example of Ford back in the day. Uh, and today, if you were to look at essentially, you know, literally having choice at, at your fingertips, perhaps when you'd want something delivered, how you'd want it delivered, right? Uh, and hence, uh, if you were now to flip it on the other side, and, I, and, and which is what today essentially is all about, if you look at from the perspective of the organization or the industry, uh, you know, what from what according to you would be, you know, would come under the scope of digital transformation in that sense? Would this be perhaps a certain division or department? Would this be uh, would this be limited to something in particular in your experience? Um, and perhaps, you know, Dr. Cho, if you'd like to take that and then I'm sure I'd come to you. Yeah, for, for an organization, I think it needs to be a culture that needs to be implemented in, in every aspect of our day-to-day -day jobs, right? Sure. And um, this, this kind of um, cultural ad adoption of digital transformation comes from the perspective that um, we are continuously improving in our day-to-day -day operations, right. right? And trying to find areas and gaps where we want to fill in, right? Uh, of course, for certain organizations that uh, that are not really aware of the, the capabilities of digital transformation, then, you know, you will continue to do things that are quite, you know, uh, comfortable or comfort zone, right? So there needs to be a balance between um, trying to transform a company digitally and trying to also ensure that the user experience at the end of the day is, is kept there as well. Uh, for example, when, when I visited factories in, in Malaysia, Mm -hmm. right um that they have implemented um you know enterprise resource planning systems that that are basically all digital transformation right mm -hmm. but when systems for example become complicated right for example if you put an erp and it becomes complicated it, it loads up very slow it's, it's not fast enough um then you have the end users frustration to say that oh look you know uh, i want to go on to this i want to do some transformation but at the end, then it's like, oh, I, I rather just do it my own way because it's actually faster. Yeah, so, so these are the, the balance that we need to, to do in the organization to ensure that whatever we transform, the, 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 um, the end user aspect is always the most important thing to, to be considered. Yeah, that's just my perspective. Fantastic. Thanks for that. Uh, Abhishek, would you like to add to that as well? Sure. Uh, you're on mute, Abhishek. Sorry, we can't quite hear you. If you could unmute yourself. Oh, sorry. Thanks. Uh, so I completely agree with what Dr. Shua said, right? Uh, it all starts with understanding, you know, what the customer needs or wants, right? And then build backwards. But just one point which I would like to maybe elaborate on is that digital transformation, and you asked about the scope, right, uh, Rohan? Um, I think, you know, uh, the scope is quite wide, which means that if real digital transformation has to happen, it needs to happen across the value chain. So, which means that, you know, it's, you know, not just, you know, the productivity on the shop floor and the processes, but also the people and obviously the consumers. Right. And uh, how it will, you know, the kind of impact it will create, uh, you know, it can be things like, you know, enhancement in your production capacity, reduction in the kind of base that you have, you know, um, I would say ability to attract better talent, retain talent, uh, you know, how you're able to impact consumer, you know, loyalty and consumer service levels mm -hmm. uh, and to the extent of, you know, now reducing environment impact, right? Sure. I think all these facets come under the scope, right? So it's basically everything, you know, across the value chain, which I think, you know, and, and that is when, you know, organizations move towards real digital transformation. Obviously, it's a journey. It takes time, yeah. but that's, I think, you know, what really uh, the full scope needs. Fantastic. I think a couple of things that I picked from what both of you mentioned, essentially, is that it's not limited to a certain team or a certain department. Of course, it's across, you know, the whole value chain, across the whole system, as Dr. Chua, you mentioned. Uh, and it's about culture. So it's not 
uh, you know, just about picking a certain skill and then being digital, but is your mindset and as a group, you know, are you supporting that? Uh, that's extremely critical as well. Uh, also, what I heard, uh, you know, uh, both of you essentially mentioned is that if you look at it from the lens of an organization, right, it shouldn't be that we want to digitize or, or you know, we want to go through a transformation. It's about what does the customer need and how can we let them have that? And hence, uh, you know, how can digital transformation help us get there? It's interesting as both of you speak about that, just a follow question to that is, uh, when you look at digital transformation, perhaps in pure play technology or technology services organizations, perhaps, uh, you know, how should I say, simpler to call this out. But I want to just get a sense that if you look at the audiences that exist within a manufacturing setup overall, uh, you've got a variety of people across teams, right? So uh, does that, from your experience, having observed, uh, you know, uh, manufacturing organizations, it, does that make it a little more complex as far as looking at digital transformation is concerned? Or is it perhaps uh, as it would be with any other organization? Uh, and Abhishek, probably would you want to take that first? Yeah, so I think, you know, I think uh, it's not a challenge to have. In fact, you know, there should be involvement, uh, you know, which makes every part of the organization and employees inclusive to this. And that's yeah. when the real digital transformation happens, right? So as I said, right, across the value chain. So whether it is maybe, you know, right from the, you know, security or your facilities to, you know, somebody who, you know, deals with suppliers to somebody who deals with, you know, your internal, uh, you know, talent, which is HR or the organization. And then, you know, moving all the way to, you know, your customer, somebody who manages your customer relationships. I think every spectrum of the employee uh, should be involved in that. To me, that's the true sense of digital transformation. Sure. Thanks for that, Abhishek. Sure. Yeah, I, I think when we talk about um, the whole company involvement in any kind of transformation, uh, it, it should be seen as something that's easy for them to adopt, right? And a lot of times, uh, many companies seem to feel that, you know, um, when they talk about transformation, it's a change of systems, it's a change of implementing new software to the company and, you know, making it more complex kind of um, uh, tools, right? So, so what we've seen is that uh, when we empower, um, you know, individuals, right, within the factory to actually create their own tools that they feel, um, you know, that will help them in their day-to-day -day tasks, uh, it actually sort of motivates the people to actually digitize because they actually have that kind of motivation or empowerment to, to build their own tools, right? So, so the, the technology advancement today has given rise to very interesting platforms that are low code and no code. Like we, we, we talk about it every day about creating citizen developers, building digital uh, adopters. And, and we see that with the kind of tools that we, we implement, uh, companies seem to adapt faster. Right, because the uh, employees feel that they have a key role in making sure things are more efficient. And, sure. and that's how we see um, transformation across departments actually uh, start moving generally. Absolutely. I think I'm going to uh, just borrow a couple of things here from what you mentioned, Dr. Chua, as well. Perhaps yeah. when Industry 1.0 and 2.0, those transformations were happening, perhaps a lot more of tell may have been happening and, and, and directive sort of way of leading. But what I hear you say is that during our times today, when you're talking about sort of, you know, um, uh, industrial revolution 4.0 and uh, factories operating in that sense, it is letting the individuals get empowered and for them to have tools to create, as you mentioned, right? And yeah. that helps uh, perhaps the transformation a lot more than perhaps it did, I'd say, maybe a few decades ago. Uh, would that be fair to say? Yep, yep, definitely. Um, I think people today need to be empowered to do um, new roles and you know and this actually also is important for not just um, talent attraction but also talent retention right so if 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 people in the company are not um, building tech or not contributing to that overall development uh, then we start to see that um, you know retention may be an issue also for companies moving forward sure Sure, no, absolutely. That actually gets me to an interesting question, right? Uh, so when you talk about di uh, digital transformation, you obviously speak about automation. We talk about digitalization overall. Um, and what we're seeing is sort of moving towards or transforming towards a new 
human machine workforce in that sense, right? So, uh, you know, has drawn a lot more attention towards what we call as human machine relationship. Uh, and of course, while there are perhaps a lot of uh, skeptics and people thinking otherwise, uh, just to get your experience in terms of, is the industry really uh, ready? You'd hear people talking about, you know, am I going to lose a job? Am I going to sort of need a skill that I haven't known? Uh, just to get your bits of music, if I could ask you just your view as well. No, sure. I think, you know, very interesting aspect, uh, you know, Rohan. And see, what's been happening is, uh, as, uh, you know, we are evolving in our journey of, uh, I would say, you know, industry uh, evolution. So industry 1.0, 2, 3, and we are now in 4, and we are soon knocking at, you know, 5.0. I think uh, the whole thing is uh, evolving from being system-centric to a human-centric approach. Right. Right. Now, what that means is that, you know, end of the day, you know, uh, we can, we cannot eliminate humans, right. In any kind of, you know, manufacturing environment, how much ever digitalization or automation we do. So, which means that, you know, both of them, humans and machines have to actually work alongside coexist. Mm -hmm. Right. And so there was some interesting piece of work, you know, which was done. And I just want to kind of, you know, quickly maybe talk about that. Sure. So we all know of, you know, uh, the Maslow's hierarchy of uh, needs, right? Very right. famous, I need not, right? And I think there, is, there was work done to really figure out that, you know, if this was the need of general, you know, human in beings, then if we really, you know, have to plot out a similar need pyramid for, you know, uh, industrial, uh, you know, uh, workforce, then what will it look like? And, and pretty much, you know, it, it, it looks very similar, right? So, uh, but the thing is, you know, at the base of it, instead of having, you know, physiological um, safety, it is, you know, it starts from, you know, safety first, right? Instead of physiological needs, uh, the industrial, you know, pyramid starts from safety, then moves over to, so safety is the very basic aspect of, you know, are, is the work environment safe? You know, uh, I, I do not have any hazard working there. And then it moves to the fact that, you know, uh, physically, am I kind of in an environment where, you know, things like ergonomics or, you know, height related things, do, I'm, am I doing things which will not, you know, impact me from a physical health perspective, right? right. And there on, you know, the hierarchy is pretty much similar, moving to, you know, belonging, esteem and self-actualization. But one of the things which has also kind of, you know, evolved, as I was saying that, you know, initially when machines came, you know, it used to be, you know, uh, as if machines and humans just kind of, you know, share, were sharing the same shop floor, they were just coexisting. But, you know, that has evolved over time, you know, from say industry 1.0 to, you know, somewhere in the third industrial revolution, it has more moved, you know, towards, um, I would say, collaboration. It's not just about machines coexisting, but collaborating with machines to, you know, achieve outcomes. And right. the next phase would be, you know, what we call leading towards compassion and co-evolution. Now, right. how I explain it is that, uh, you know, co-evolution will be, or compassion will be somewhere where machines will be able to be empathetic towards what the need of their human operator is, right? Is, is the person kind of doing well in terms of, you know, his health statistics and, um, you know, the mental balance and those kind of things. And machine will be, you know, a basis that evaluation be able to kind of, you know, modulate or reconfigure itself, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Basis the need of the human. And likewise, human will be able to kind of, you know, health check the machine and take corrective action. So that's what, you know, it will evolve to co-evaluation. So basically wow. it is, it is moved from being a system centric approach to a highly human centric approach, I would say. Wonderful. I could almost visualize the hierarchy as you mentioned. Thanks Abhishek, for bringing that up. Dr. Chair, would you like to uh, share your thoughts as well? Yeah, I, I think uh, Abhishek mentioned a, a very um, good point about, um, you know, uh, human-centric approach because um, when we look at that whole industry 4.0 um, landscape, right, um, a lot of times people talk about technology, people talk about, you know, um, how machines can be intelligent, how uh, systems can be intelligent, but 
the, the key problem now is actually how the human factor comes in, right? And, and we see that adoption of, of technologies um, are not to say moving as fast as I would expect it to be is because the, the human centric part of it is, is the missing element from, from what I understand. So, so if, we, if we were to uh, want to improve on that, uh, then the, the collaborative kind of um, framework of, of human machine interaction will be the most important thing moving forward. That's why now you can see that there's a lot of movement into um, creating things like collaborative robotics, you know, uh, cyber cognitive systems. And these are tools that we believe that will move the, the industry forward to the next step. But most importantly is now having the right uh, people or the humans to actually move this technology forward. Absolutely. I think one thing that also comes to my mind uh, for all the, uh, you know, the future of work that I follow, understand a lot of the technology companies are talking about not just AI, right, but ethical AI. So what are the frameworks are you building uh, uh, artificial intelligence on? Um, and like, you know, Vishak mentioned that there'd be empathy that the machines would have in times to come. Uh, so it's not just about technology uh, for technology's sake, but about how human centered is technology moving ahead. And so beautiful, as you said, you know, humans and machines would coexist, perhaps from a point uh, uh, a few years ago where we said, uh, you know, machines are dangerous. Uh, I, like I said, uh, Abhishek, I could almost visualize the hierarchy there to a point where actually, uh, you know, machines would get to a point where they understand how you're feeling and they're able to cal calibrate themselves. Wonderful thought that's going to stay in my mind, uh, you know, for a bit. So, uh, <coughs> so it's moving on to, to, uh, to another thought then, you know, uh, usually as manufacturing as an industry is really known for, you know, things that are documented and you've got processes, and, you know, manuals, so on and so forth. Uh, and, you know, essentially because there are processes so that's required. And so when we're talking about the future, uh, what comes to my mind as a look at that as well as, as 4.0 and rightly Abhishek said, knocking on 5.0, how relevant is transfer of, you know, what we would sort of term as tribal knowledge uh, from the retiring sort of baby boomers um, for the newer generation sort of coming in to be ready? Yeah, I think, very, very, again, you know, very relevant question uh, for the times. And, uh, and I like to quote, you know, one of the, uh, you know, uh, facts, which is uh, from United Nations, and they did some study and it says that, you know, by 2050, mm -hmm. every fifth person of the world's population will be aged 60 years or older, right? Um, now compare that with 2015, when only every eighth person, you know, uh, belong to this age group. So, so that's the experience how the workforce is really aging, right? right. And uh, and, and, and so, which means that, you know, of course, you know, this workforce has immense amount of, you know, as you said, tribal knowledge, which needs to be transferred, right? And, and uh, that's in best interest of the organizations. Uh, but I feel that about traditional mechanisms, which is kind of, you know, um, classroom kind of sessions or training programs may not really be suitable, uh, you know, in, in this thing. One, you know, um, I think that's not maybe the best way of pedagogy. That is, you know, one part of it, but that cannot be everything, right? Sure. And so we need to figure out ways, you know, where and how we can uh, very effectively and impactfully capture some of this tribal knowledge, right? right. And, uh, you know, there are kind of, you know, technologies and I would like to quote, you know, some of them. So things like, you know, you have augmented reality, right uh, which is which is uh, being used increasingly to kind of you know capture some of this knowledge right so the way it works is that you know uh, so you so if you have you know our aging workforce and there's suppose a particular process which uh, needs to be captured right uh, mm -hmm. we just need to kind of you know maybe one of the ways is kind of you know video record it and annotate it with you know a lot of instructions and all that the other piece is kind of, you know, we do this uh, knowledge transfer using augmented reality, right? And I think some of these uh, are much impactful because one, you know, these also talk about, I would say if an organization using these ways to do the knowledge retention or transfer, I'm sure, you know, they will uh, boast themselves as, you know, 
highly attractive for the new generation of workforce. So, you know, it also then helps you in a way, not only I would say capture the knowledge, but also position yourself, uh, you know, in the talent market as a progressive organization, which is using, you know, such uh, technologies and hence be able to attract, you know, uh, the right kind of, you know, talent. So I think, you know, uh, uh, that, that's the way I think, you know, how some of this tribal knowledge can be very impactfully captured through. Beautifully. Thanks, Atan Abhishek, for sharing that. Uh, Dr. Chua, would you like to add to it as well? Yep. Uh, I guess when it comes to um, any kind of um, experiential kind of, um, you know, knowledge from, from the very, very senior staff, uh, it, it requires the company to actually um, find a way to build what we call as a knowledge base or a knowledge database, uh, which, which actually forms the whole concept of moving from, um, you know, reactive to predictive to what we call as prescriptive, right? Because eventually what we want to do is to create that kind of knowledge database um, from, from each of the uh, employees in, in where we are. So that it becomes like, you know, when we talk about manufacturing, uh, it's always about root cause analysis and then you have solutions. And most of the time, these kind of solutions are not documented, which also becomes a problem. And those are things that actually, you know, if you sort of um, document them well and come up with the right systems, you can actually solve problems even faster, right? And of course, the next step of it is to utilize technology to quantify or to measure what previously we could not measure, right? For example, like um, a very experienced person can walk past a the machine, they can hear, hear sounds that the machine is, um, you know, doing and then he say, okay, you know, it's time to do some servicing here, right? Uh, yeah. But a, a junior person will probably walk past and say, oh yeah, I think this is like day-to-day -day sound that we see every day. So, so now the question is, how do we quantify or, or measure that kind of signals, right, from a machine to tell us that, hey, you know, um, the machine is making this sound and this sound is actually useful data that we can then use it for future analytics. We can then come up with, you know, predictive capacities, prescriptive capacities. And, and that's how we sort of in a way, um, you know, transform that tribal knowledge into something that's more digitized, right? Because it's, it's always a, a challenge also to get someone so experienced to right. transfer that knowledge to someone very junior, right? Um, because they don't have time, they don't have, you know, they, they don't have uh, the right, um, how to say, motivation to transfer. Also, there, there could be fear of loss of job when you transfer knowledge to someone, right? right. So, so one of the, the key ways would be to see how we can translate that, you know, or digitize that kind of knowledge, you know, so that we can help the future generations to also learn from these mistakes or learn from this experience and then we move forward. Beautifully. Again, I'm visualizing some of these descriptions. I'm so glad, you know, we've got some of these examples coming up. In fact, uh, you know, in my past, I worked with an, a manufacturing organization um, in Kaltais. And the, the example you spoke about walking across the machine and literally hear the sound, I think, is something I've experienced in the past, right? So how can an individual who's gained this tribal knowledge over years of experience, and you can't quite teach that to somebody over a training program, per se. it's about gaining that experience themselves, right? And how can that be transferred and digitally sort of made available? And you also beautifully brought about the, uh, you know, vulnerability that somebody who's sharing the information could have that I could lose my job. And somebody who's receiving it to say that this is not important. I mean, I'm, I'm, I am in from the data age. And for me, it's about numbers coming in from the output. It's not about, you know, looking at the sounds. How do you make it, uh, you know, in some senses, uh, uh, okay for both? And I'm also borrowing from what Abhishek said earlier that machines and humans are going to coexist whatever happens, right? So it's about individuals to realize and how do you maximize where you are at the moment um, and, and ensure that this human-machine relationship sort of works, you know, quite well. Um, so so wonderful. I think I'm, I'm so excited as we move into, uh, you know, some, some uh, more sort of, how shall I say, deeper parts of this conversation. And I wanted to sort of, uh, you know, bring in, uh, you know, the thought that, uh, you know, when we talk about digital leadership, um, it's about organizations, it's about processes, it's about people, of course, as you said, right? So how critical is that is digital leadership as organizations endeavor to successfully drive digital transformation? Are there perhaps some behaviors that sort of come out from 
uh, leaders who are sort of in that sense digitally forward? Is there something in particular that you want to call out from your experience of, of having seen that? Yeah. So, so I think you know uh, what I define right. Digital leadership is uh, about orchestrating technology and okay. creating a culture where you know the entire organization you know utilizes this technology towards enhanced business outcomes and delivering the customer needs. To me, right. that's what digital leadership is. Right. It's not just about, as you rightly said, it's not just about you know, uh, processes, it's about, you know, culture, it's about taking everybody along, right? So, so sure. to me, I think that's important. And a couple of things, which I think, you know, as a digital leader, you know, a few characteristics, which really stand out for me. So one is, you know, um, of course, you know, uh, it has to be around leveraging and adoption of technology, right? And creating that culture, you know, which helps people learn and adopt these technology, right? train, retrain, reskill, whatever it is. Uh, the other piece is kind of, you know, inspiring, right? Not only, you know, uh, yourself, but I think the entire organization. It, it is a lot about inspiration because some of these digital journeys, transformation journeys can be long, right? And there's very chance that, you know, people may kind of, you know, lose motivation along the way. And hence, there has to be an inspirational leader constantly drives this journey and not let people kind of lose their steam on the way, right? Uh, a lot of collaboration, absolutely important because, uh, you know, uh, it is not, as I said, you know, it's across the value chain. It's not that, you know, one piece, and as they say, right, uh, in the entire chain, the weakest <clears throat> link is the weakest part of the entire chain, right? So we have to take the entire organization, hence a lot of collaboration. So somebody who can encourage that collaboration Big piece is also about driving innovation, right? Constantly keep improvising on your own benchmarks and keep kind of looking for newer, innovative things, uh, you know? And uh, last but not the least, it's end of day about business. They are running a business. It's not for the sake of doing a digital transformation they are doing, but they have to actually give business outcomes as well. And hence, there should always be a sight on how are you managing risk. As a leader, you should never lose sight of that while whatever you do, right? So to me, I right. think these are some of the characteristics of, of a successful, you know, so-called digital leader. Fantastic. Thanks for articulating that, Abhishek. Uh, Dr. Chua? Uh, yeah, uh, for, for us, for us, leadership buy-in is, is always um, the most important part uh, for any kind of transformation. Right. And, and because if, if the leadership do not see the value in the kind of transformation, um, it's very hard for them to spend the dollar and cents generally. Right. So, so when, when we started to, to introduce, you know, digital tools, digital transformation strategies, um, like we, we had a use case where we brought an entire team of, um, you know, managers, technical people there. Um, you know, we, we showed them, you know, this is our Malaysian smart factory. This is what can be done. This is what is possible for your organization. Um, they love it. They really love it. Right. And when they go back, you know, um, they, they actually went to propose to their top management and top management say, okay, you know, let's wait a bit, you know, and, you know, we, we waited for a few months and we thought that, hey, you know, why not we just do um, you know, we just invite your CEO over, your managing director over. Let's let's talk to your senior level management and show them what's possible, right? And and the surprising part was that, you know, the the CEO came over and then he had a look, and then he 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 went to his um you know the managers and then he said, look what you see here, I want you to implement this exact same thing in one month, right? And and that's all it needs you know to to start that kind of ball rolling right so so the the whole idea about making sure that the leaders are involved in that transformation is a whole very important step right a lot of times um you know leaders may may be um you know thinking that hey you know um i'll just pass it on to somebody you know they will figure it out uh, as long as you can bring me dollar and cents at the end of the month then that's about it but the involvement of that transformation from the leaders, we believe are very important, right? Mm -hmm. Because they are the final decision makers. They should know exactly what they're implementing, 
right? And if, if something is not right or is not well um, positioned or well aligned for their company moving forward, they need to highlight it from the start. So, so we because um, we don't want to have a digital strategy where you know um, halfway you know the, the the top leadership management say hey, oh you know let's put a hold hold on this and let's think about it again, right? So so in terms of digital leadership, I think that the real key strength of a leader would be to see whether they have foresight, mm -hmm. right? If they have very good foresight about technologies moving forward, then definitely we we know that that is a company that's going to really focus on digitization for the next few years. Fantastic. I think, you know, these pearls that we're hearing now just can't be lost, right, about the fact that the leaders can either be enablers or perhaps the other, you know, the other direction, as you said. So fantastic. Thanks for that, Dr. Chua. Uh, I also want to just uh, invite, as we take the next few minutes uh, of questions that I've got, uh, also, you know, for, uh, for the audiences to put down their questions as well. So over the last 10 to 12 minutes, we'll take questions, uh, you know, going ahead as well. Uh, so the last couple of questions, perhaps from my side at this point that I'd want to ask as well. Um, so when you actually look at, uh, you know, the the way the world has been over the last some time, it's been sort of virtual and hybrid, uh, you know, how do you see usually manufacturing as an industry is where you pretty much have everybody right in there, right? Um, and the world has been perhaps impacted quite a bit over the last two and a half, three years. Uh, how do you see that as uh, sort of the, the dispersed workforce or perhaps, you know, being increasingly hybrid? Um, how has that impacted the operations in manufacturing? Yeah. So, so I think, you know, one of the things we all know that, you know, uh, the relation came that, you know, when pandemic, you know, in, it was in nobody's country, mm -hmm. right? But I think, you know, what uh, I would say smart organizations and companies did was used they use technology as a big enabler, right? And, but even before that, I think, you know, the biggest point, and, and I think, you know, all, all I would say organizations who, who are leaders in their spaces, it was important to keep the workforce safe. That was par of paramount importance, right? Uh, right? One, and second is, you know, they were at the height of, you know, pandemic when, you know, the organizations, uh, you know, needed to keep their manufacturing, operations on, you know, uh, there was this big apprehension among the families of, you know, letting their near and dear ones go and walk in those manufacturing shop floors, right? Yeah. So it was also about, big thing about, you know, communicating with the families and convincing them, right? But I think, you know, what uh, some of the good organizations did was they quickly, as I said, you know, utilize technology to create that safe environment and mm -hmm. then to use some of those examples to showcase and communicate to the family saying, hey, we have taken these, these, these measures will help, you know, all of us be safe. And that I think, you know, was, was uh, I think a big um, starting point. And there are various things which, uh, you know, various organizations did. There are a lot of organizations which, you know, I have, you know, an example of an organization which realized that there are certain processes where it was about, you know, they had a continuous operation, right? And maybe, you know, it will uh, say, for example, you know, I'm talking about, uh, about a paint or chemical kind of, you know, company where there was a mixing operation where the motor should never stop, right? That's very, very critical. It should continuously, you know, keep running. And they used to have somebody to monitor that in person. Now, what they realized is this can be very well, you know, achieved by smart technologies, which can kind of, you know, remotely connect through some sensors here in the rear uh, real shop floor to somebody sitting you know remotely and just monitoring on a continuous basis this is working or not right so they utilize that as a, as a technology right now a lot of organizations they realize that you know to run the operations you obviously need constant you know workforce and and hence our old you know methods of workforce planning were no longer I know, valid. Now we needed smart, I would say, softwares or platforms which can actually take variable, you know, different variables into account. Things like, you know, what kind of skills, maybe what are shifts, or if, you know, somebody, what kind of health condition somebody is in, or maybe, you know, if somebody is staying in a containment zone, uh, you know, plus what our internal production schedules and so on and so forth. They put all these variables and created a platform which could, you know, clearly throw out, hey, 
these are the right kind of people who can be deployed in shift A, maybe shift B and shift C, right? So that I think, you know, was, was a good use of technology during uh, the times. Uh, of course, uh, you know, other kind of technology means were, which, you know, many of us, even non-manufacturing organizations used was about, you know, collaboration tools, right? How can we give a sense of, you know, be connected to each other, even though we are remote. So, you know, various sorts of, you know, um, flat collaborative platforms came in, things like, you know, um, shared platforms, or, you know, you, you do collaborative exercise with, you know, e-whiteboards where everybody can actually do a whiteboarding sitting, you know, maybe uh, <laughs> many, many, you know, miles away, right? right. Uh, and, and that I think, you know, gave a, a sense of, I would say, connectedness, even though people were not physically or in person meeting each other. So, you know, right. to me, I think, uh, some of these were good examples of how, say, manufacturing and otherwise the organizations could, you know, utilize technology to their right. advantage, right, uh, in, in right. managing dispersed workforce. Wonderful. Uh, and, and as they say, you know, that uh, necessity is a mother of all invention. So really collaborating, working across time zones sort of came up quite naturally. Uh, Dr. Chua, your views as well? Yeah, I think eventually, um, you know, manufacturing operations as it slowly grows a bit more, um, you know, a bit more digitized and infrastructures are well placed. Mm -hmm. uh, then I think that the capability of, of having a more dispersed workforce would, would actually work, right? But we also see that, um, you know, that there is always a tendency to um, monitor what the people are doing on the other side of the screen. Right, so so it's it's something where um, it requires a little bit more, um, you know, careful management about how we we manage that kind of dispersed workforce, right? Like for example, during the pandemic, um, like in Malaysia, you know, manufacturers had no choice, right? Uh, they they have to sort of work on this kind of um arrangement, and the the management will have to will have to work from home mainly, and the 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 operates operation team will be mainly in the factory. But the difficult part of it is always, um, you know, how do we um, effectively monitor or, or support, right? So I think with the new rise of, um, you know, more digital work tools and, you know, not only collaborative tools, but now we talk about the evolution of mixed reality or, or we talk about the evolution of uh, merged reality. Right, that I think that will eventually um, help to create a much more effective, um, diverse, and dispersed workforce moving forward. With all the evolution of smart glasses and so on, th those will really um, thrive in, in the next few years. Yeah. Wonderful. Thanks. Thanks for sharing that. And while you know uh, the passion and person and me can keep going, perhaps with questions, but I'm going to be uh, you know uh, opening up uh, the, you know the line for for folks to put in their questions as well. Ellie has put in her question, so I want to probably uh, you know bring this up for all of us to begin with, and and then you know pick from there. I invite the others as well to to put in your questions and thoughts. Uh, so Ellie says, you know, I hear Abhishek articulating about talent attraction and retention as a bar of transformation. So rather than looking at that as a challenge, looking at that as an opportunity, could you probably share a little bit more, Abhishek, from your perspective? Yeah. So if I get the question right, it's it's about, uh, you know, uh, how digital transformation can be utilized for better attraction and retention? That's correct. Okay. No, absolutely. So I think, uh, see, the thing is, uh, as we get into, you know, adopting technology and moving towards digital transformation, you know, the world is moving. But, you know, as an organization, if we prove ourselves to be successful in that journey, right, that, of course, you know, has a cascading effect in the entire ecosystem. It's not just for employees, but I would say, you know, our suppliers, partners, consumers, you know, um, or other ecosystem partners that we work, you know, including our employees and our prospective kind of, you know, I would say future uh, employees, because it then positions ourselves as, you know, a progressive employer of choice, which everybody would want to join, because, you know, you are one kind of, you know, getting to know and understand the latest, uh, you know, technologies, but also I think, you know, you are positioning yourself as an organization, which is, which is the first mover in some of this. 
right? And, and that all kind of, you know, creates, I would uh, say, a, a very well, you know, employer branding for any organization. Wonderful. Uh, you know, and I think I was thinking of this and you know, Ellie sort of brought the question inside, ran through my mind that how do you look at that a lot more? I think you beautifully articulate that. How do you position yourself as somebody who's letting all of these things sort of come through as well? So uh, thanks for that, Abhishek. Mr. Joe, would you, Dr. Shah, would you like to add anything at all while we pick the other question from what Abhishek just mentioned? Is there anything from your perspective you'd like to add as well? No, no, I'm all good with what Abhishek mentioned. Yeah, yeah. Fantastic. So uh, we see uh, another question coming in from uh, Krishnayinda. Um, uh, he's, he works with GM Modular. Uh, he says, you know, can uh, digital transformation help in employee engagement? I think partially what uh, Abhishek just mentioned as well, attraction one, and then engagement of, of the workforce. So, you know, both of you, um, you'd like to share your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I think definitely uh, em employee engagement is something that digital transformation can really support that because uh, when we talk about um, digital tools, we talk about collaboration, right? And through collaboration kind of tools, that's where you can really thrive, right? Uh, in terms of, um, you know, visualizing what is really the progress, um, you know, you, you don't have to chase one another, you have proper traceability, um, you actually can engage with your, your colleagues, even though you're not sitting next to each other, right? And, and that's something where, you know, digital transformation can really, really um, show the value in that sense. Fantastic. So as an organization which embraces that, uh, a lot many more people want to, you know, work for such organizations. And the ones who are in them want to stay there longer. Abhishek, is there anything you'd like to add as well? No, I think I, I completely agree with, you know, what uh, Dr. Shua said. And just to add, I think, and, and this is something, you know, what uh, I have seen, you know, we do in Rockwell Automation. So uh, we have been really propagating, you know, for some time, uh, uh, creation or, or enhancement of a very strong culture of innovation, right? Uh, basically trying to embed innovation as part of our culture, Right. And, and uh, I think that also kind of, you know, is, is a big uh, tool for engagement in a way that, you know, and, and it takes leave from, you know, what Dr. Shu was saying about collaboration. So we have kind of, you know, created a, a role within our organization, you know, a, a leader, a leadership whose role is just to kind of, you know, inject innovation or bring about that culture of innovation in the organization. And there are platforms which have been created, which help bring this uh, you know innovation by bringing in you know uh, i would say talent across the globe working in you know uh, i would say different geographies different functions obviously different ethnic backgrounds but bringing them for a cause which all of them are passionate about so if there is you know uh, an idea which spring up say in one part of the world you know it's posted in that platform and they say that, hey, any of you want to kind of, you know, join hands with me, I'm trying to work on this idea. And maybe, you know, there are people who stream back somebody from Europe, somebody maybe from Africa, somebody from, say, Malaysia, and they all say that, hey, we'll all collaborate to work on this uh, and maybe, you know, work on this uh, solution. Right? So that is the kind of collaboration which this platform is bringing. And that, of course, I'm seeing is bringing huge amount of, you know, engagement in the organizations. People are really enjoying because they are getting to live their passion right so, so i just wanted to add that fantastic wonderfully said and and what actually uh, you know the way i was looking at this conversation as we started the things that i actually wanted to come to pretty much got an answer now so i'm just going to probably refer to that as we uh, you know connect the dots as we as we wrap this conversation i think essentially is that uh, earlier as as industrial revolutions happened it was really about the worry uh, about essentially, you know, what's going to happen next? Uh, are we going to be required or not? Are there going to be skills I need to learn and let go of something I have picked up? Uh, are machines going to take over, you know, what I'm doing, so on and so forth? Perhaps a lot many more movies in the recent past may have, uh, you know, had some of these fears being injected as well. But, you know, what we hear from, uh, from both of you, uh, and of course from the questions coming uh, in as well, uh, is that there is a sense of, uh, you know, the customer at the center of the transformation. And so digital transformation helping that make a, a better experience for the customer. At the same time, if organizations are able to deal with some of the fears that the employees um, you know, may face, 
uh, how we're able to kind of help them, uh, you know, work through that. Some very, uh, you know, uh, interesting thoughts about how leadership deals with that. How do they create, um, you know, that safety net? Uh, how are some of the behaviors, you know, whether it's collaboration, whether it's innovation, whether it's sort of looking at uh, how do we optimize for technology that we have and not get handicapped by that, right? Came in uh, quite beautifully. Um, and what actually, uh, one of the strongest things that I'm sort of going to take back is that at the moment, we are sort of coexisting humans and machines are coexisting. But for the future, essentially, there will be machines who will actually be able to understand our emotions, right? Uh, and in fact, make us operate far better uh, than we could. And so the future, uh, you know, may seem like different from today, but different doesn't necessarily mean difficult, right? So something that uh, will actually work perhaps for our better. So I think with that, I would probably like to uh, open perhaps a minute for both of us, perhaps if you'd like to just, you know, uh, pass your closing comments as we wrap today up. So Dr. Chua, perhaps would you want to share your thoughts perhaps a minute? Yeah, sure. So uh, generally, I, I believe that um, digital transformation or any kind of um, transformation begins with the people first. Right, and, and this is actually a very, very important uh, factor that um, that we believe would be and something which companies should focus on moving forward because when we talk about talents and we talk about people, you know, those are the key drivers of the company, right? And, and we definitely can't replace um, a person with a robot, you know, working towards the whole factory, right? You always need to have that people element to move forward. Super. Thanks, Tanak. Sure. Abhishek? Yeah, and, and I would absolutely maybe build on what, you know, Dr. Shua said, you know, it, it is being, you know, uh, human-centric, you know, how this whole uh, human-machine interface will move towards a human-centric kind of, you know, uh, I would say evolution. Uh, whereas, you know, as I said, you know, machines becoming more empathetic towards, you know, uh, humans or the operators they are working with. And, you know, as a parting, I would just like to, you know, uh, maybe mention about this, uh, uh, you know, interesting book, which I read uh, a while back. Uh, it's titled Clara and the Sun by, you know, Nobel laureate um, Kazuo Ishiguro. And this very beautifully put about, you know, it, it's all about, you know, artificial friends, your robots who will be your friends in future. And it actually shows, you know, how some of these artificial friends and robots living along with humans pick up, you know, uh, through their AI ML based, you know, about the, I, I would say, mannerisms about the emotions of the humans there and kind of on you know, their AI machine really matures them or, uh, you know, in, in terms of being more empathetic towards the humans they are working with. So very interesting read and I think very relevant to what we are talking today. So with that, I would just like to say uh, thanks. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Chua. Thanks, Atan Abhishek, for taking your time and for sharing both of your valuable experiences. Thank you so much, all of our attendees, um, you know, for your interesting participation and your questions. Uh, my colleague has just put in uh, a link to, to hear your feedback. Uh, this is not the last, I mean, uh, this is not the first, of course, that we've got you. There are multiple industries that we sort of get together and look at how digital transformation is moving on the ground. Uh, thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. Look forward to see you in another edition. Have a good day. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.